The many misconceptions and missed opportunities leading up to the Second Battle of Bull Run, especially the movements recounted in the previous video on August 29, 1862, brought about a series of courts of inquiry resulting in the court-martial of Fitz John Porter. Rigged from the outset against Porter and delayed during the Antietam campaign, the trial was a travesty of justice that Porter spent decades to rectify. The saddest part of this legal battle was that the lawyer-turned-president, Abraham Lincoln, approved a verdict that did not hold up to any scrutiny. Individuals interested in protecting their own careers and to go after George B. McClellan scapegoated Porter for the outcome of the Second Battle of Bull Run. Porter's problems had started with some of his ill-advised and uncensored opinions about John Pope, his new commander at the Army of Virginia, which became known to the political leadership in Washington and Pope himself. The confused events of August 29 were Porter's downfall. He had received a number of contradictory orders and assumed for far too long that General Irvin McDowell had direct command over him. When he received orders by Pope to advance and attack, Porter on his own authority decided to not attack, as it was far too late in the day for a meaningful attack. Pope had considered arresting Porter that day and bringing up on charges. However, in direct violation of military policy, Porter remained in command of the V Corps until after the Battle of Antietam. After the Battle of Antietam, President Lincoln briefly visited the Army of the Potomac and Porter used the opportunity to talk with Lincoln, especially about his ill-advised messages before Second Bull Run. Lincoln dishonestly did not tell Porter that he believed Porter guilty of deliberately disobeying Pope's orders. In the War Department, the wheels were already in motion to scapegoat Porter. On November 10, 1862, after a review of the Fifth Corps, Porter and his men learned that he had orders to report to Washington. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and his gung-ho Judge Advocate General of the United States Army, Joseph Holt, were ready to prosecute Porter for disobedience and assemble a panel of judges willing to do their bidding. The initial panel had David Hunter as the presiding officer. Joining Hunter was James Garfield, who had been staying with Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, where he had heard many negative stories about McClellan and Porter. Joining them was Benjamin Prentice, who had just been exchanged after getting captured at Shiloh. Napoleon Buford, who had not been in military service for 25 years, but had recently come out of retirement. And finally, 
William W. Morris, a man with 40 years of service under his belt. However, the commission was dissolved over its clear bias against Porter, but all except Morris were reappointed on the next enlarged commission. Making matters worse for Porter, on the new commission were also Rufus King and James Ricketts, who had a clear and vested interest in convicting Porter to avoid blame themselves. Similarly, Silas Casey was mad at Porter for the latter having orchestrated his removal from command by McClellan. Four members of the commission had been poisoned against Porter during dinners with Salmon P. Chase and Edwin Stanton, and three members had personal grudges against Porter. Stanton left little to chance and made sure to poison the minds of the judges against Porter, as well as selecting judges hostile to the general. The trial's verdict would be reviewed and confirmed by Holt and President Lincoln, who remains a great unknown. However, the president seemed also biased against the general on trial. Porter had the support of his lawyers, the highly regarded Charles Emus and Emus associate, Reverdy Johnson. On December 1st, Holt finished the charges and the inquiry opened. Porter finally received the charges against him and requested three days to review them and compile a witness list for his defense. Before giving Porter an answer, Hunter ejected everybody from the room. Holt apparently needed some time to coach the just-arrived John Pope for his testimony and urged delay in the opening of proceedings. The court did not answer Porter's request for three days, even though Hunter wanted to begin quickly. Porter had a chance to challenge any of the commissioners for bias against him. He did not know that one of the judges was friends with Stanton, and that four of them were poisoned against him by Stanton and Shanks. Furthermore, as all objections were in blatant hypocrisy decided in favor of the prosecution, Porter's lawyers understood that they fought a losing battle. Porter, however, hoped for the power of the press and open proceedings to benefit him. Holt read the charges, some of which were outrightly preposterous and without a shred of evidence, but some had the danger that if convicted, Porter could face the death penalty. Before entering, a not guilty plea. Porter's lawyers objected that it seemed Holt and Stanton used Pope's inspector general as a charging authority as a proxy for Pope. After secret conversation, Hunter dismissed the objections, despite Pope privately having said that it was true. On December 4, John Pope took the stand and told his version of August 29 and Second Bull Run. Holt had coached Pope well on the right word choices and how to highlight material that implicated Porter, leaving, for example, McDowell's similar disobedience unmentioned. Pope, however, buckled under Reverdy Johnson's fierce cross-examination. Johnson eventually cornered Pope with a question of why he had not brought charges if he thought Porter had disobeyed him, or if he assumed Porter not guilty by not bringing charges. Pope refused to answer, and Hunter came to his rescue by calling the question irrelevant after his secret consultation. Porter's attorneys immediately objected, having anticipated the turn of events. Hunter again ejected everyone from the room, as it was clear, Pope's credibility as a witness was crumbling. The court adjourned for the day. The next morning, after another brief secret session, Pope answered that he had only well after the battle, when he saw letters by Porter's dismissing his ability, realized 
Porter's deliberate disobedience. He also claimed falsely that he had not wished to bring charges, restoring some of his credibility. The sham of the trial continued when Benny Roberts came to the witness stand. Many former army friends of Porter offered to testify against Roberts and his untrustworthiness. This time, Amos handled the cross-examination and cornered Roberts, who blamed Porter for not attacking when Porter had not even received the orders to do so yet. On December 10, Captain Douglas Pope came before the commission and testified that he had delivered Pope's 4.30 p.m. order to attack at about 5 p.m. But he was guessing. Thomas Smith's testimony was even more damaging, but his destruction during cross-examination only further illustrated his bias against Porter and lack of basic military knowledge. Eventually, Irvin Medow, faced with his own court of inquiry, took the stand with a vested interest to deflect blame from himself to Porter. By this point, Porter's lawyers understood that their asking for opinions would not have, but the prosecution could do so at liberty. McDowell showed a serious lack of memory during cross-examination. He may have generally not remembered or misjudged times. As the trial progressed, Holt brought forward Porter's messages to Burnside. He had edited them leaving out good sections, benefiting Porter. Hunter prohibited, at this point, the cross-examination of witnesses, allegedly to save time. However, from December 16 to 19, the court took a leisurely approach, with few witnesses and brief hearings. On Christmas Eve, Porter's defense could take the room but faced stonewalling immediately when trying to introduce telegraphs showing Portis' loyalty. The defense worked to illustrate that McDowell had command over Porter due to the geographic proximity between the two and Pope's distance from the section of the field. On January 5, Holt asked King to step down as judge and testify as a witness to undermine the case of the defense. McDowell, too, was called one more time. It is difficult to say if both King and McDowell engaged in deceit, something worse to consider, since both stood to benefit, blaming Porter and deflecting from their own failures. While the prosecution had 15 days to make its case, the defense only had nine. At that point, Stanton called for a speedy conclusion as the officers on the commission were needed elsewhere. Oddly, Stanton had no such rush with McDowell's inquiry, which lasted almost three months. Lincoln needed some good publicity after Burnside's defeat at Fredericksburg and the growing embarrassment with the press covering the defense of Porter and the government's efforts to derail it. Despite only having three days between the trial's conclusion on January 6 and final arguments on January 10, Amos prepared a 25,000-word long defense that showed that Porter had obeyed the orders received and that the 4.30 p.m. order was given under false assumptions of the enemy's position as well as Porter's. However, for the judges the statement was a tiresome requirement of no value. To the surprise of everyone, however, Holt declined to make a final argument, to save time, as he said. The court reached a verdict and reported it for review. Instead of providing Lincoln with a trial summary of the case, Holt produced a closing argument where he refuted all the defense's arguments and testimonies, often with deft falsehood. Lincoln 
must have read the report within 60 hours of receipt. Lincoln likely never reviewed the evidence and voluminous trial record and just went with Holtz's quote-unquote report. People, and likely Holt, were well aware that Lincoln was easy game for manipulative opportunists, as historian William Marvel observed. Lincoln had no desire to spend days locating distortions and with the morale of the Army of the Potomac crumbling after the recent mud marsh, Lincoln signed off on Porter's conviction and ousted him from the army. Porter fought the next 20 years to have the verdict overturned, but many of the trial members and their associates in Congress prevented his redemption until 1886, when Porter was restored to the rank of colonel in the regular army, but not provided any back pay. It is a sad reminder how political and military leadership work together, scapegoating Porter, and that Lincoln was a deeply flawed political leader who let such a legal travesty happen, despite his often so highly lauded legal talent. Thank you for watching this episode of the War of the Rebellion channel. If you liked the material covered, please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell for new episodes. If there's a story of the War of the Rebellion you would like covered, please leave a comment. Use the comments to engage in conversations. Thank you for patronizing the War of the Rebellion channel.